good to be with all of you this evening, and I appreciate your presence. Thankful that we have this time to assemble together, and I hope we'll make the most of it to focus our minds on things above while we examine the things that are here. And in doing that, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and we'll begin our first reading there and work our way to the fourth chapter. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. In 1990... Alan Jackson released a song titled, Here in the Real World. Many of you probably remember that if you're my age or maybe older. I remember that very well. It's very popular. I think that song was nominated Song of the Year twice, uh, which doesn't always happen. But it's a song about life, real life. And I'm not going to sing it for you, <laughs> but I will uh, repeat some of the words. Uh, the first verse of that song begins by saying, Cowboys don't cry and heroes don't die. Good always wins again and again. Love is a sweet dream that always comes true. And if life were like the movies, I'd never be blue. Then the chorus goes, but here in the real world, it ain't that easy at all. And isn't that true? We all understand that. It's a very true song. Life is not like a Hallmark movie, is it? You know what I mean when I say life's not like a Hallmark movie. You watch a Hallmark movie, and you know what's going to happen. Everything's going to work out just like everyone wants it to work out. Everyone's going to get together just like everyone wants to get together. Everything that is troubling and hard just seems to work itself out by the time the movie comes to a close. But we certainly don't live in a Hallmark movie because life has its difficulties, it has its disappointments, it has its trials, and it has its tribulations. And we all have to deal with those things from time to time. Don't we? And in 1989, when Alan Jackson and a man named Mark Irwin both co-wrote that song here in the real world, they didn't come up with that concept on their own. No, that concept's been a part of life as long as there has been life. And I guess one of the wisest men who ever lived wrote about it when he penned this book we know as Ecclesiastes. And he was examining life, looking into it, trying to figure out what all these things mean that are going on around us. And he had a very cynical view of that as he began to examine. In chapter 1, in verse 14, remember what he said. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Like, this life is useless. It's just like trying to catch the wind and hold on to it. And I don't know if you've ever tried that, but it's, it's impossible. And Solomon said, that's, that's what I see when I start to examine what's going on around me. But then he re-examined things, and he asked that question one more time. And when you get to chapter 3, and Jackson, we didn't talk about this at all, but your reading works out very well. You get to chapter 3 and verse 9 and you find Solomon again asking a question. What profit has the worker from that which in which he labors? I have seen the God-given task which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He now re-examines things with a Godward outlook and he says, look, I realize that you know life does have difficulty, but those things are there for a purpose. All this turmoil and trial that I have to wade through from time to time. It's, it's here because it's molding me and it's shaping me. Solomon had, by the time we get to chapter 3, he's looked above and he's began to realize that God has a purpose for every season. And again, that purpose is shaping us into these beings that are befitted to be his people. He looked within and he saw that man is an eternal being. And there again, we're being shaped for not this life, but the life that is to come. Solomon looked to the future, and he saw that, you know what, death is coming. Every day that we live, it's coming a little faster. But at the same time, death's not the end because judgment is coming, and God is going to judge each person according to their deeds. But by the time we get to chapter 4, he's again looking at something he has not yet addressed, and that is what is around each and every one of us. And that's the burdens of the real world and how those things factor into the lives that we live as we sojourn here on this earth. 
And as Solomon begins to examine these things, he again looks at it through a cynical view, first of all. But that's not where he wants us to stay. He wants us to understand that if you only have this cynical view of life, then these things that you experience day in and day out are not going to help you. They're only going to hinder you and make things worse. But look at them through that Godward view and have that vision on things above, and it will help you as you live here below. And as we get into chapter 4, he's going to show us four things that we all need to have an understanding of so that we can rightly apply the lives we live here, as Solomon says, under the sun. First of all, what we see is the burden of government corruption. Notice what Solomon has to say about that beginning in chapter 4. We'll read the first three verses. Then I returned and considered all the oppression that is done under the sun. And look, the tears of the oppressed, but they have no comforter. On the side of their oppressors there was power, but they have no comforter. Therefore I praise the dead who were already dead, more than the living who are still alive. Yet better than both is he who has never existed, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. It's interesting that Solomon looks into his own government. And what does he see? In his own government, that which he rules over is just the epitome of corruption itself. He looks into it and he sees several things. He sees that things aren't right, things need to be changed, but even though those things aren't right and need to be changed, no one's doing anything about it. And it just goes on and on and on again like a cycle that no one can stop. Not even Solomon. And you, take, you back up and you take a, a wide view of this and you have to remind yourself that yes, God has put a system of government in place here at this point for Israel. And this, and this system was to be conducted according to God's will. But what will men do? Men can even corrupt the system that God puts in place. Hold your place here just for a second and turn back with me to Psalm 82. And notice what the psalmist had to say about this very thing. Psalm 82. Just a couple of verses here, but it really sets the tone. A psalm of Asaph, beginning in verse 1. He writes, God stands in the congregation of the mighty, he judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? The word gods there, little g, is just talking about judges. The word is used there as mighty ones in the Hebrew, but it's just talking about judges among the people. And God stands in the, in the midst of the congregation of these judges, and He says, how long will you judge unjustly? I've put a system in place, God says, but what have you done to it? You've corrupted it, and you've abused it, and you continue to corrupt and abuse that which I have put in place. Back again to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Solomon looks into even his own government that he rules over, and he sees these very things going on. The first thing that he sees is wickedness in the place of judgment. If you look back into chapter 3 and look at verse 16, he said that specifically. Moreover, I saw under the sun in the place of judgment Wickedness was there. And in the price of righteousness, iniquity was there. What should have been there? Justice. But what did he find? Wickedness. Oh, how discouraging that can be. He also looks and he sees sadness and agony in the lives of the people who are supposed to be doing right or being done right by the system that is in place. But what he sees is these people being abused by those who have influence and power. And these people are sad because they have nothing within themselves to be able to change that which is looming over them and oppressing them. They want it to change. They long for it to change. But there's nothing they can do about it. The government that's in place has the ability to abuse them by their power and they're taking full advantage of that, even those who can't do anything about it. And even furthermore, there's indifference on the part of those who could have consoled those who were being comforted. Two times back in chapter 4, you see it says, Solomon says, but they have no comforter. And then again, they have no comforter. What do you see here? What's the picture that's being painted? It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, isn't it? 
You've got a government, a mighty influence that's in place, and the subjects of that government are being abused by the power that is. And people are signing in agony, and they're being mistreated, and they want it to change, but there's nothing they can do to change it. And even those around them who could have comforted them could care less if they were comforted or not. It was all about me, myself, and I, and me getting out of this hole, and I don't care if you die. Sound familiar? That's exactly what we have going on in the world that we see around us many times. And that's what Solomon saw too. But you may be thinking, well, here's Solomon, this wise and strong king himself, and how mighty he was. Why in the world didn't Solomon step in and stop this wickedness? Let me ask you a question. Have you ever known a ruler, a president, or anyone else that was in power that was able to do away with government corruption? The answer is no. And you never will. It cannot happen. You want, you want to know what the most infallible system of constitutional liberty is? Political corruption. It'll always be there. And no one can ever do away with it. And Solomon had to come to terms with that and learn that, look, I'm just going to have to live with it even though I'm the ruler of this kingdom. And we have to be able to see the same thing that Solomon sees. It may be difficult at times. But there again, today, under the sun, there's nothing new. What do we see? When we look in the place of judgment, brethren, what do we see? Do we not see wickedness? Do we not see things that should be done wrong and they're not even moral? But those things are carried out and those who are in power and have influence abuse those who do not have power and cannot change it and do nothing about it. And sometimes we are the ones who are oppressed, aren't we? And we see sadness in lives of the people who, who want things to be different, who want change, who are being so pressed down. But there's nobody there to comfort them. Even the ones who could comfort them could care less. We live in a dog-eat-dog world even today, and it's all about me, myself, and I, and I just want to get out of the pit and stay out of the pit, and I don't care if you die. Is that not the world we live in today, generally speaking? It most certainly is. And it was the world that Solomon lived in as well. And we look at, it, at our, our government around us and we scowl at it and we scoff at it and we say, we've got to do something about this corruption. We've got to change it. And we get so wrapped up in politics that politics consumes us and we talk more about politics and the kingdoms of the world than we do the kingdom of God. But let me tell you something. If the wisest and richest king that's ever lived could do nothing about political corruption, what makes you think that we're ever going to change it? We're not. Please understand that we need to be good citizens of this world. We need to obey the laws of this land. We need to live in a way as to have a good influence toward godliness and righteousness as we live here. And we need to pray for those who were ruling in these places of power so that we can continue to live these lives and preach the gospel and serve our God without hindrance. But I'm going to tell you something. We need not get so consumed with who's going to sit in this seat in the Senate and this seat in the House of Representatives or who's going to sit in the White House. Do you know why? Because the kingdoms of this world are going to fall apart, but the kingdom of God will stand and stand forever. And we need to be more concerned about getting people into the kingdom of God then what about people are doing here upon this earth? I'm not saying there's, there's all wrong in politics and having something to do with it, but it's wrong when we get so consumed with it that we think changing society is the answer to changing the world. Brethren, the answer to changing the world is Jesus Christ and His gospel. And we need to be more consumed with that than we're consumed with anything else. And political corruption is always going to be in place. And you're not going to get rid of it. Donald Trump's not going to get rid of it. Joe Biden's not going to get rid of it. And I don't care who you put in the White House. They're not going to get rid of it. You know what we're going to have to do? We're going to do like Solomon, learn to endure it with godliness and wisdom from the Word and allow that to make us long for heaven. Don't live your life here. 
Live your life with your sights set on home with God. That's the lesson that we need to learn from the burden of government corruption. Secondly, he talks to us about the burden of labor or the lack thereof. Pick up with me in verse 4. He writes here, Again, I saw that for all toil and every skillful work, a man is envied by his neighbor. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Better is a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. I want to stop right there. And, and we'll work our way down to verse 7. First of all, what Solomon does now is he turns and he observes all these various laborers who are working there around and some who aren't working at all. We saw that. But what he does as he looks into this is he sees different people, how they're working or not working at all, and the way they're carrying these things about. First of all, he sees the workaholic. And that's what you see there in verse 4. For all toil and every skillful work. I mean, this is a man who has a skill and he's using that skill. More modern translations talk about a man who's working with a competitive spirit having a rivalry against another. Now, you can see that in your mind, can't you? you got a man who's working, and his, his work is competitive. He's wanting to be better than everyone else. And he's got a rivalry going because he wants to have more. He wants to be better. I want to have more stuff than you've got. I want to have a bigger bank account than you've got. And you've got a man who just works and works and works his fingers to the bone because all he wants to do is gain more and more and more, and he wants to be the best in the eyes of the world. But he's going to be the best. He can't quit. So he just keeps working, and he just keeps working, and he just keeps working. And what does Solomon say about that there again? That's just vanity and grasping for the wind. Because all you're doing is working, and you're just building up all this stuff, but you don't have time to use it. You don't have time to do the things that are most important in life because you're more concerned about the things that are of least importance. He also points out the sloth. There in verse 5, the fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. That's the lazy man. That's the person who will not work. He doesn't want to do anything. You know, Solomon's had something to say about uh, the lazy man. Turn back to Proverbs chapter 19. Hold your place here. We'll come right back. Proverbs chapter 19, look at verse 15. I really like... What he says here, it makes a lot of sense to what we're talking about. Verse 15 of Proverbs chapter 19. Solomon writes here, Slothfulness casts one into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. I have known some really lazy people in my life. Have you? I mean, I've known some really lazy people, and I am not a lazy person. And I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I'm just, I've just never been wired that way. This never could stand not, have, not being able to have something to do. But I've known some people who could care less about having something to do. And you know what they were in? It was like they were in a lazy man's coma when it came to work. I mean, they were just in a coma, and they couldn't come out of it. Is that not really what Solomon's talking about here? Slothfulness casts one into a deep sleep. It's like you convinced yourself that you just can't do anything, so you're not going to do anything. But what does that do? Both verses here, verse 5 of chapter 4 and Proverbs 19, 15, both tell us that that man, what he does, when he convinces himself that he doesn't need to do anything, doesn't want to do anything, and eventually you just convince yourself, I can't do anything, you know what you do? You ruin yourself. You destroy yourself and everyone else that you're responsible for. Why? Because you're too selfish to take care of yourself and your own. And the biblical writers have always despised such laziness because God despises it. There again, if you move on, you'll see that there's, there's a balanced one here, though. And that's the integrated man. Look at verse 6. Better is a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. Now you've got a guy who's balanced. He's responsible 
He's working and he's providing for himself and for his own. But at the same time, he's not consumed with work. He's not consumed with being the best among his workaholic peers. He doesn't have to have his name up in light saying that this is the number one man. He's got more stuff. And he's always going to have more stuff because he's going to work himself to death just to have it. No, this guy understands that I have to to provide, but at the same time, I need to make time to make sure that I'm a balanced man and those whom I'm responsible for not only have provisions to live on, but they've got to have a life that's worthy of the time that I'm spending with them. Uh, They should be worthy of the time that I spend with them. A home can only be made if time is spent therein. And Solomon points out here that someone has to have time to be able to give the attention to his spouse and to his family that they need to have so that they can have a well-balanced life also. If your home is missing a mother or a father that aren't there most of the time, then something's going to break down within that home and it's not going to be good. And if I spend all of my time slaving and working my fingers to the bone just to make sure that I've got all of this stuff and I want to hang on to this stuff, but my family falls apart because I don't have enough time for them, I have failed. So what he wants us to see is is that this needs to be balanced. Yes, I need to uphold my responsibilities to make sure that I work and provide, but at the same time, I need to make sure that I have time for my family to spend that good time with them so that they can understand the most important things in life. That brings us to verse 7. He looks again. I don't know what happened there. Okay. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor brother, yet there is no end to all his labors. Nor is is the eye satisfied with riches, but he never asked. For whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This is also vanity and a grave misfortune. You see, this is another person altogether. This isn't a person who has a family and wants his family to have all of the, you know, the material things of life, the best of the things. He doesn't want the, you know, he he, he doesn't have a wife to have the biggest house and the greatest cars and all the grandest things. He doesn't even have a wife. He doesn't have any kids. It's just himself. He has no son. He has no brother. But there again, all he does is work. And he works. And he works his fingers to the bone. And he has all of these riches. But he's not satisfied with those riches. He looks at them and he says, Oh, wow, there's riches. I need more of those. But he never, ever asks himself, What in the world am I doing? Why am I doing this? You see, it's just a constant circle of meaninglessness. You can have all the money in the world. You can have the most money in the world. But if you're not getting anything good from it, nor benefiting anyone else with it, then what good is it? If all you do is work and make money and pile up and stockpile your riches for no reason whatsoever but to be rich and to look back and say, look at all I've got. What good has it done for you? This man can never stop to ask himself, Why am I doing this? He never turned around to say, well, I'm not benefiting anyone else. I'm not providing jobs for anyone else because he worked by himself. And there again, he's not putting back an inheritance for anyone else. He doesn't have anyone to draw from. Who's going to draw from his work? He's this guy at the end of the day who's lonely. He has no purpose in life, no real purpose. But all he does is run around this endless circle that has nothing in it but meaninglessness. Time and time and time again. Well, he's the loner, by the way. When we look into our world today, I mean, can we just say that there's nothing new under the sun? How many people do you know right now who are workaholics? How many of you in the building right now are workaholics and you you took off enough time today just to be here in the building? And I'm glad you're here. But what about the rest of the life that you live? 
Is there someone in the pew tonight who's just so lazy you don't feel like you need to work, don't want to work, and somebody else needs to provide for you? Are you that loner here tonight who just doesn't want anybody else to be a part of your life? I just want to work. I just want to lay up treasure for myself. It's about me, me, me. But really, at the end of the day, I have nothing. And life's just miserable because I just keep doing this endless cycle. And at the end of the day, it's all meaningless. Because I have nothing that I'm working toward or for. Solomon wants all three of these people that he's spoken of to be examined and examined carefully. But he wants us to understand, yes, we need to work. God desires for us to work with our own hands, to provide for our own and live a quiet life. But at the same time, he does not want us to be people who are concerned, consumed with the jobs that we have and only laying up earthly treasure. He wants us to be that integrated man, that balanced one, who understands that I have to have time with the family that I have. And even if you don't have a family, you have to have time for people in your life that are going to be good, beneficial for you to help you see the most important things. And sometimes when you're all alone, and Solomon's going to get there in this next point, when you're all alone and you have nothing else to live for with not God in your life or anyone else good in your life, all that you can see and look at is that person you see in the mirror and you live for that person and that person alone. And that's never good, is it? Because that's a life of selfishness. What's the lesson that we have to take from this? Well, the lesson is the happiest people aren't always the wealthiest or the leisureliest. That's a real word, by the way. Did y'all know that? I did not until I found it. I didn't have enough room to put most leisurely, so I threw it out there, and guess what? It's a word. But the people who have the most aren't always the happiest. And the people who sit around and do the least... Guess what? They aren't always the happiest either. Do you know who the richest, happiest people in the world are? They're people who have sincere relationships. Number one, a sincere relationship with God and a sincere relationship with good brethren and friends. Those are the richest people in the world. And aren't you thankful that you have those sincere relationships? Jesus wants us to have those. When Jesus was questioned about what was the greatest commandment in the law, Matthew 22 and verse 37, he answered by saying, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. That's how you build sincere relationships, isn't it? And when we have sincere relationships like that, then we can find true contentment and satisfaction. But listen to me. You've got to have time to build relationships like that. The person who's the workaholic, (laughs) that person doesn't have time to build a relationship with God, nor with his wife, nor with brethren, or have good friends, because he's consumed with himself and laying up his earthly treasure. The lazy person is so consumed with being lazy That's all that person cares about. That's the person who's destroying himself, and you all know lazy people who destroy themselves. And they care nothing about anything else but just doing nothing. But the integrated person is the person who's going to uphold his responsibilities in the physical, but he's also going to make time, spend time, take time to make that relationship with God and to make that relationship with good brethren and good friends because those sincere relationships are the things that are going to help us overcome the burdens of this life. And we must have them. A third thing Solomon points out is the burden of being alone. And it seems that he's looked into this loner long enough that he understands that, man, it's good to have a companion. Please understand this. There's nothing in the context about marriage. We're not talking about marriage here at all. So let's just take our minds away from that. We're talking about companionship, but not the marriage relationship at all. Look at verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, 
One will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Two are better than one when it comes to working. You know, I was studying this this week. I, Bill Gravitt mentioned something to me last week going through the foyer. He's telling me that, that someone had been asked by a lot of people to study Ecclesiastes. Well, he got it. it's his fault. He got Ecclesiastes in my mind. And I told Andrew the other day, man, I, I can't get Ecclesiastes out of my head. And I do this. You, you know it. I have to preach something from Ecclesiastes every once in a while. And I just had Ecclesiastes working in my brain. So I, I, I wind up in chapter 4. And I get to this point, two are better than one when it comes to working. And my mind goes back to when I was a kid, I had to pick up square bales of hay in the hay field at least twice every year, sometimes three times, depending on how much rain rain we had. And you know what? I've been in the hay field by myself. And y'all, it's terrible. You cannot accomplish anything by yourself trying to pick up hay and put it on a trailer in the hay field when you're having to drive the truck, pick up the hay, load the hay, and stack it all by yourself. If you've done that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But you know what was always a blessing? Oh, when your cousin showed up to help. You know, he's here. You know what we could do? We had this old Chevrolet truck, and it had a granny low in it. You know what I'm talking about? And you could put that thing in that real low gear, let out on the clutch, and get out of it. It would just drive on straight. We had a nail driven in the floorboard. We bent it over, bungee strapped the steering wheel to that bent over nail, keep it driving straight. You know what? Somebody could pick up hay, throw it on the trailer, another one could stack it. And we could go to the end of the row, turn the truck around, and do the same thing. You know what? That was efficient. Was two better than one? Oh, you bet it was. And we got something accomplished. And that's what Solomon's talking about here. He understands that. Two people can accomplish so much more and they can earn more for their work, can't they? They have more benefit from their labor when they're working together. If someone gets, if someone falls down, if something breaks, well, you can help get it fixed and get it all back together. Four hands are much swifter than two. And that goes to all areas of life. He also points out that two are better than one when it comes to survival. What do you mean by survival? Well, there again, look at verse 11. If two lie down together, what can they do? They keep warm, can't they? There again, we're not talking about marriage here. And believe me, I, I, like, to, I like to have a, my wife sleep with me in the bed. That's why I got married. I didn't get married to sleep by myself. I've never understood why husband and wife sleep separate. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about two people working together. Let's just say in Solomon's day, someone had to go on a journey. And maybe they had to go through harsh territory, harsh environment. Hey, if they had to stop and camp for a night and it was cold, guess what? You might freeze to death. But I want to tell you something that I know something about. I have backpacked in the mountains enough, and I have been in the Smokies way up there in the middle of nowhere when there was snow on the ground in January and I was proud to have someone else in my tent just to have the extra body heat because that helped me keep warm. And the point that Solomon is making is it's like two are better than one when it comes to survival. Jesus sent them out how? Two by two because he knew they could help one another with the work that they were doing. They could help one another stay alive. And they also could help one another be safe. Well, that's been a principle that's been all throughout biblical times. Does not Solomon make that point too? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. When you have good companionship, you can take care of one another. You can provide for one another. You can help and encourage one another. What he's talking about here is the necessity of good relationships again. It's a burden to be alone in life. It's not good to be a loner. And there's nothing new under the sun today. You know what that I have enjoyed more than anything? One of the most, one of the greatest things I've enjoyed over the last almost five years now is having a coworker. 
to be able to work with in the work that I'm doing here. I've never had that before. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't trade it for anything. To have a good man like Andrew who can share the load with me. And we help one another. And we, we, we share and we bear the load together. And if someone's got a little bit more, then we step in and we help out so we're not overburdened. And I believe everything goes really well. And I, I, I definitely wouldn't want to change that. Two are definitely better than one. And I'm sure when you look into the things that you do, you would have to agree that two are better than one. I mean, think about in instances where you need to stay alive. Do you want to be by yourself? Or do you want to have some help? What about you go into an area somewhere where it's a little bit shady? Do you want to go by yourself or do you want to take someone with you? I know some places that I don't want to go door knocking by myself. But I'll go if someone's with me. Now, I want you to think about that. Let's back up and look at that spiritually speaking. Do we not need good companionship when it comes to brethren and our spiritual work that we do together? We can't, we can't do the work that we're doing here in the kingdom by ourselves. We need one another to encourage one another and to help one another along. In the same way, we're looking out for one another when it comes to spiritual survival. Listen, brethren, disciples, don't be loners. We need one another to help one another through we're trying to keep one another safe and secure within fellowship with God. Isn't that important to us? Well, God says we need that. What's the lesson for us? Physically speaking, sure, but also spiritually speaking, what is it? Strength is what? Strength is always in numbers. The burden of being alone can be overcome by just having and maintaining good godly companionship. Isn't that a blessing? Finally, Solomon points out the burden of popularity. Look at verse 13. We'll finish the chapter. Better is a poor and wise youth than an old foolish king who will be admonished no more. For he comes out of prison to be king, although he was born in his kingdom. I saw all the living who walk under the sun. They were with the second youth who stands in his place. There was no end of all the people over whom he was made king. Yet those who come afterward will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Solomon points out the unreliability of popularity. And it's really unreliable. So many people long for it. But it will always let you down. And I don't know if there's a better person to understand that than Solomon. He knew exactly how popularity could fail you. But he points out here, you've got this old king who's, who's been reigning for so long. All these years he's been reigning and now he's gotten to the point to when someone comes to give him counsel, he doesn't even want to hear that. I know it all. What do you mean you're coming to, to give me some advice? I don't need your advice. Don't you know who the king is? Solomon says, that's a fool. Solomon is telling us we never get too old to learn something, nor do we ever become too popular for someone else to tell us something that we need to know. And he also points out that a fool is someone who thinks that he's irreplaceable. This king here thought, not only thought that he knew everything, he didn't think there was anybody else that could take his place. I'm the man, and as long as I'm here, I'm going to be the man, and Nobody can tell me any different, and there's surely no one that can replace me. Popularity wanes like the shifting of the wind, does it? What happened to this guy? Well, Solomon points out, you know, it's better to be a poor, wise youth who's been in prison than it is to be this foolish old king who will not listen to wisdom. Why? Because the old king was deposed because of his lack of humility and the one who came out of prison, the poor wise youth, he's now made king. Solomon points out, though this one was born poor in the kingdom, 
Now he's the one ruling over the kingdom. So never, if, and I think leaders, any leader in any place can look at this and say, never let me think that I'm the best there ever was. Because what that does, it develops a sense of pride within me. And if I keep telling myself that I'm the best there ever will be, and there's nothing else that I need to know, then eventually I will, be able, I will lose every sense of humility that I have. And no one wants to follow a prideful, arrogant individual. It's repulsive. And all of us who are in some type of leadership positions need to understand that. But we all can fall victim to the detriment of popularity. You've got this guy who was made king, the, the poor youth. Look on down there. Look at verse 15. I saw all the living who walk under the sun. They were with the second youth who stands in his place. There was no end to all the people whom he was made king. There were all these people who were with him. They were standing with him. He's our king. But then what happened? Another generation comes along and guess what? They don't care anything about that guy. What do you not need to do? Don't hang on to your popularity. Why? Because the same people that were cheering for you when you're made king were the same people who were screaming for you to be hanged. It happens. Oh, believe me, it happens. So we can't rest our laurels on just being popular in the eyes of the world. We've got to rest our principles on the fact that we want to be people who are, number one, godly. Number two, consistent in regard to our godliness. We need to be firm, but at the same time, we need to be humble. Because humility, humility is what causes us not to be seen as popular in the eyes of the world, but to be respected. And that's what we need is respect. Respect from individuals. So individuals can look in us and see something that's different. And that's what he's pointing out here. Let me give you one more passage from the Proverbs. Look at chapter 15 and verse 20. Proverbs 15 and verse 20. That is not what I want. 1320. I'm sorry. Notice what Solomon says here. He who walks with wise men will be wise. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. We never need to get too big for our britches. I always heard that growing up. But I think it's accurate. You know, we can, get so, we can think we're so big and we're so, you know, we, we're so powerful and we've, we've got so much within ourselves. We don't think there's anything that anyone else can give us. But I don't care how much we've achieved, how much we've accomplished in our lives. There's always someone who can help us. And I need to have the humility to be able to accept that. And I need to tell myself that too. And I try to remind myself of that all the time. That I can always learn something from someone else. And if we are going to be leaders for others, we have to learn that popularity is not something that we need. Not, nor something we should desire. But respect that comes from being humble in the eyes of others, that's what's going to help us be who we need to be. There's nothing new under the sun today. Being well known is not all it's cracked up to be. Not in the eyes of the world. But what should we want? There again, we should just want to be people who are, are not looking to be seen as, as these people who are to be looked up to and envied. but people who are looked at as, as people who are solid. If we learn anything from Solomon and what he learned in his venture around the sun, we need to learn that, that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. If Solomon could go back and do it all over again, he would tell us, you know what? Just be humble. Though you may have a lot and you may know a lot, present yourself as humble. 
Because you're going to teach someone a whole lot more. You're going to lead someone a whole lot further if, they can, if you can be approachable. And reproachable people are those people that earn the respect of others. As we look at this, in what Solomon has looked at, Solomon has looked above and he saw that God's in control and every season of life has a purpose. He's looked within and he saw that man's an eternal being. But there again, God's using the seasons and the times of this life to shape us and mold us to be with Him forever. He looked into the future and He saw that death's coming. But also, death's not the end. The death's just preparing us to be eternal. And everybody's going to have an eternal place. Solomon looked around and he saw that there are burdens of the life. There's hard times. But use these Burdens to motivate you to long for heaven. Solomon looks and he sees that, you know what, it needs to be a balance. Do not ever give up the permanent to get your hands on the temporary. Solomon looks out and, and he sees that, you know, life is about not just selfishness and greediness and covetousness. Life is about sincere relationships with God and with others. And those sincere relationships are what's going to help us overcome this world. And as far as popularity goes, Solomon said, you know what? Popularity can be poisonous. But godly wisdom and humility is what will lead us to life and life more abundantly. Isn't that right? The wise man has taught us well. It certainly wasn't me. But let's take this and apply it to our lives. And I hope it's been beneficial to you as much as it has to me. That's your lesson tonight. If you're here tonight and you need to respond to the gospel in any way, we stand ready to help you tonight. If you need to become a Christian and you've heard the gospel and you believe it, why not obey it tonight through repentance and baptism? We stand ready to help you and we'll rejoice with the angels in you doing so. If you need to make your life right with God in any way, why not come now while we stand and we sing this song?